Hello, yes, that's right. It's Joe here for Joyride TV live from Vasiliki, Greece. That's right. Yes, I'm back with some more Q and A. Um, at some point, we're actually going to fix which day this is going to go out on, and there will be. Um, but for now, we're here today. So if you are watching this later on, uh, once it's uploaded, uh, just to let you know what is going on, uh, this is being recorded live, where people are asking questions live, uh, which I'm responding to. If in the comments later, you've got any questions that occur to you, then I will respond to them, but it won't be in the live video, of course. Uh, I will either respond in the comments or I'll take your question and use it as a preloaded question for next week's Q&A, which I'm thinking will go back to Fridays. So this week we're going to have a double, a double shift on the Q&A of Monday and Friday. But um, so that is the vibe. So hello to HJ in the uh, Blackwood Forest, Germany. Great to have you on board. And hello to Nick. Uh, good to have you here as always, Nick. Hope that your finger is doing well. Oh, hi, Holly. Uh, that's Holly in Oman, I believe. Great that you could tune in. Um, I'd it'd be interested to know how this on a Monday is working out for everyone because uh, it's kind of up to you guys as a whole on what which day we do this because I haven't got much else on, to be honest. So um, if the Monday is better than the Friday, then we could do the Q&A on the Monday. Perhaps you go sailing at the weekend and you find some problems that you have with your boats over the weekend and uh, you want to get it off your chest straight away afterwards. Or perhaps you'd rather ask the questions before the weekend to get in the mood for going out on the water. It's up to you. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to go back to Friday as we were before. Or there's the other one. We could go midweek uh, just to have something, uh, talk a bit of boating in the middle of the week. We could go for the Wednesday. Uh, everything is possible. So there we go. Um, Yes. So, Steve-O, how was Athens? Yes, I've just been to Athens. Uh, it was my wedding anniversary, 10 years, in fact, of being married. So we went to Athens and Athens was absolutely incredible. I've never actually been there other than to the airport or to drop boats off or things before. So to actually go and be a tourist in Athens was fantastic, highly recommended. So much to see. It is exhausting. That's right. Jazz, how you doing? How's it, man? Um, want to know when you kite, do you go twin tip or strapless? And when you're going to upload kite videos? Yeah, I'm, um, as soon as we get some wind, I think we did actually have some wind. I think it must have been last Tuesday. So I did get out for a kite in Vasiliki Bay um, in the onshore wind, which means we get these small um, waves coming in, which is quite fun. And I've um, always stuck to the twin tip just because I find it really fun, really easy. And um, I did try some directional kiting back in the day. And I always found it a bit uncomfortable. And on the wave, it was really nice. But uh, for just having a good time and messing around on the water, the twin tips certainly wins a lot of points. You can also, uh, this is a kite surfing uh, uh, thing, but also with the twin tip board on the kite surfing, you can hold more power, which means you could do bigger jumps. So that is one thing that I'm very much into is doing bigger jumps. All right. Yeah. But um, next time I go out, I will uh, put a camera on because I want to do one of these. Um, how fast does it go? Videos. Because I did windsurfing. I did the paddleboard. I did the RS Zest. I did the laser. 
I want to do the kite surfing as well. Just sort of like free ride kite surfing, not going for mega speed or anything, but just to find out what a kite surfer goes along at as a speed in different situations. I think that would be quite interesting. All right, Nick says the finger is 100% operational. That is great news. Yeah, I did actually um, go sailing with Nick on Bad Boy, Bad Boy 94. Uh, probably, I think it must have been around the start of September. Um, and um, one of the trapeze handles broke when Nick was getting onto the boat at broke and it uh, cut his finger. So I'm a bit concerned there, obviously. All right. Oh, my goodness. I see a question coming up there. Rich. Hello, Rich. Says Athens is unreal. Yeah. Um, went to the old Olympic Stadium, the original Olympic Stadium. And you can really see where it all comes from. All of the because uh, uh, Greece has got a very rich heritage of sporting events. And that Olympic Stadium was where it was kind of formalized. And uh, what an inspirational place to go as an international athlete, I'm sure. Um, right, we've got Stick Daring, who says, when are you going to make a writing poll that actually works? Oh, my goodness, yes. Um, well, all the boats are stored away now for the winter. But, uh, you know, the one that I, the writing poll that, let's, Let's talk a bit of writing poll here is um, if we take our capsized boat um, like this, how are we do it there? Yes, nicely. Um, OK, the holes are slightly different sizes um, and there's the mast there and there's the water like that. Um, so what we've. What we found, here's a summary of the failed writing poll attempts. When we have a writing poll that goes out like this, if we're still standing on the boat like this, even if we're hanging on the end of the pole, we're not getting any extra... Um, we're not actually getting any extra leverage and it's not doing anything more because we're still actually in the same position as if we had the writing line out there anyway. And the writing pole would probably be anchored somewhere pretty similar. So it's not actually any difference. To, to, for it to be different, this writing pole, if it was to be about this length would be that we'd need perhaps it to be a bit longer and we'd need to stand on the end of the pole so we're as far away from the boat as possible so that we're um our weight is as far away as possible getting more leverage more weight against the rig and then it is more likely to come up now the method that i've seen most frequently on the internet is this one where you have uh, what's a bit like a plank of wood which goes in here or maybe up at an angle a bit where it's kind of it'll be anchored here and you basically walk the plank and when you get to the end then you've got so much leverage that it is going to bring the boat upright nicely. Yeah, so that is going to be the design. The way, the reason that I haven't really gone for it yet is because I'm just a bit bothered by the having to stash this piece of equipment on the boat. I know it's nice to do the test to actually have a final, yes, we've made one that works, but where you put it on the boat that's my kind of issue, which is why I tried this one, which ties to the dolphin striker. So it just folds away. Uh, so it's quite um, tidy. And that's why I like the writing bag as well, because it's very compact. You just 
put it in the pocket or roll it up tight to the tramp lacing and off you go. Uh, whereas the plank of wood method, which definitely works, it's quite a clanky piece to be taken along with you. So for that reason, that's why I haven't pursued that so much. Um, the other thing I didn't like so much with the clanky piece of wood that works is at this end, it needs to be exceptionally well padded. Otherwise, you're going to damage the hull down here. So I was a little bit uh, wary about that as well. So that's why that hasn't happened yet. But uh, it's going to happen. Of course, it is because I can't leave this unfinished. But uh, things keep coming up, at which get in the way of writing pole construction. So there we go. All right, yeah, so um, if you didn't see it yesterday, uh, the Show Us Your Cat special from the Tornado Worlds, uh, which was about three weeks ago, four weeks ago now, uh, was released. A very fine video where I'm actually talking to, I think, five different teams uh, at the Tornado Worlds, uh, and they all had very different boats. Uh, so that's quite interesting to take a look at. So if you haven't seen that, that is worth a look. All right, Steve-O says, why did you only come third at the stadium? Yeah, that was because uh, sometimes things happen. You know, at least I got on the podium. Anyway, that was something from Facebook. Um, oh, Steve-O FX1 says, uh, are you the... I believe EB must be Eastbourne Laser King. Uh, now there's a question. All right, so I have got some preloaded questions, which uh, I think I'm just going to crack on with the first one now. So just moving on to the questions. Uh, this is from Albert. Last week we were talking a bit about um, transferring hull lifting energy into more boat speed by taking the boat more downwind. So if you fly the hull, you take the boat more downwind, and then that energy that was being used to fly the hull can actually be converted into more boat speed. Uh, but Albert's just following on, on this. He says, so if placing myself more backwards on the catamaran, and the catamaran is still tending towards pitch poling, you would rather ease the main sheet than steering back up towards the beam reach. So a very good opening question there. So wind is coming down the board as always. So when we are really uh, smoking it, we'll start, we're going for, so we're going for speed. So we're gonna start off on a beam reach, kind of like here. We, we're still in the going for speed story. Any type of catamaran, uh, just without the spinnaker, that is uh, the main thing here. We get a gust, the hull lifts, we wanna go faster. So um, just making sure that we are in a good position on the boat, which would probably be as far back as possible. I'm just going to draw one person um, because we're just getting as far back as possible. So we get a gust of wind, hull lifts to go a bit faster. We're going to turn more downwind. But as we turn, it is important to ease a bit of main sheet as we turn more downwind, because by easing a bit of main sheet, we're taking the pressure off the leeward bow, so it's less likely to go under the water. Also, by easing the main sheet, you really can balance the trim of the boat. If you bear away without easing main sheet, the bow is going to go down, but by easing main sheet, you can really gauge. Uh, where you are in terms of sticking the bows in. 
And then if we do get down onto this kind of broad reaching angle, what Albert is asking there is if when the bow starts to dip and it looks like you're going to stick it under, is it better to turn back towards the beam reach or to ease the main sheet off? Well, because our objective here is to sail as fast as possible, by turning back up towards the B ridge, we're not going to go any faster. We're actually going to slow down a bit. And the more steering that we do, the more it's going to disturb the flow of water under the boat. And we are going to be gradually slowing down. Whereas if we're on this beam reach and the bow's dipping, that means, uh, sorry, broad reach, it means that we're really, really powered. So there is some big speed on the table there. So yes, we are going to ease the main sheet. If you've got a few, if, if you are sailing two up as well, your crew could ease the jib off as well if they're quick on the sheet. So if the bow dips, the main sheet being eased is going to have the biggest effect. Uh, but the jib being eased as well, that's going to help. And actually, by easing the jib, it means you're not going to have to ease as much main sheet. So it really is a team game to balance the boat there. And then we could be absolutely gunning it, uh, just trimming the main sheet against that leeward bow. On this point of sail, it is slightly less likely that you're going to have that capsized sideways feeling or if you do then of course you can ease the main sheet a bit more turn more downwind more boat speed on the table um yeah so that is about the size of it if you're having to constantly ease main sheet to uh prevent the bow from going under then the thing to do there is to ease the traveler a bit more so then you can sail with the main sheet tighter the tighter you have the main sheet, the more, uh, the less you're going to have to adjust it to control your power. So that is um, why we're trying to sail with the main sheet really tight all the time. It gives us more control, means we don't have to, ad to adjust the sheet as much. There we go. All right, so um, that is part one of Albert's question. Part two, moving on, he says, yes, yeah, so we wouldn't, in fact, just to finish off another detail on point one, where he says, would you steer back towards the beam reach? The time where you would steer back towards the beam reach is actually if you start to lose power, if the wind starts to drop off a bit, because you can't maintain this kind of point of sail double trapezing unless you've got loads of power. So if the wind does drop off a bit, that would be the time to turn back up towards the beam reach a bit just to get a bit more power on. If we look at, not the it's not the fastest, but the most powered point of sail is the beam reach because the wind is hitting you square on. So it's going to give you the most hull lifting force. Um, then that means that by turning back towards the beam reach, you can still be double trapezing there. All right. Next part of the question. If you are close hauled, so going upwind in strong wind, would you prefer also to ease the main sheet? and not heading up um, right just i'm just doing a bit of reading here um i believe albert's first language isn't english uh okay so on the upwind point of sale then um what we're going to do to control the power in the strong wind is we're going to be using a combination of main sheet and steering. 
Now, once again, if it is a strong wind, to avoid having to use too much main sheet, we're going to let the traveller out so that we can sail with the main sheet in very tight. But we're going to sail, we're also going to control the power if sailing upwind by generally sailing with the boat uh, pointing quite close to the wind. That is going to help us to keep the power on more. And then if we do get a gust on the upwind leg, if it's a small gust and we can keep the hull at the same angle, we want to have uh, the hull lifted so that the windward, hold on, drawing issues here, so that the windward hull is just out of the water. That's a little bit high, actually. Um, but we want to keep the boat so the windward hull is just lifted. So if we can keep the boat flying at that optimal angle, uh, just by steering the boat up towards the wind a little bit without losing any speed, then we can do it just on the steering. So we're going to allow the boat to come up towards the wind slightly uh, to stop the hull from lifting any higher. But if to stop the hull lifting any higher, we have to turn so far towards the wind that we're going to start slowing down, then that's the time when we also want to be easing an armful of main sheet. And that means by easing the main sheet and steering up to the wind as a combination, uh, that means we are going to be keeping the speed on more of the time. And then, of course, if we need to put the power on, like perhaps if we're coming out of that gust, we can then uh, bring the boat back off the wind slightly. So back onto our original course, bring the main sheet back in. There we go. So upwind, we're using a combination of steering up and main sheet to control the power. There we go. All right. I think that is about the size of it. And then just to make sure I have completed this question. Someone once told me that easing the main sheet upwind in strong wind puts the center of force more backwards, which would increase the risk of the capsize backwards. No, the only reason that easing the main sheet might actually cause you to capsize backwards more is the Newton's cradle effect, where if you're double trapezing, we, yeah, this is good. There's a foot. So if we're double trapezing here and we dump too much main sheet, which actually means that we're putting ourselves in the water, the water's going to send us off the back. And that way we're going to capsize backwards. But I wouldn't say it's because we're moving the center of effort too far in one way or the other way, which is going to make us go over in that way. OK, but thanks very much, Albert, for your continued questions on this uh, sailing fast topic, which is, of course, one of my favorites. Um, and we have Shane uh, in the live chat. Hi, is there some good places you would recommend to sail in Portugal? Now, there is the question. Um, unfortunately, my knowledge of Portuguese sailing locations is pretty limited. So I can't help you there, I'm afraid, Shane. I would uh, certainly employ some fairly uh, rigorous Google searches and see what comes up with the right sort of pictures. And also, what is handy is if you are thinking of going uh, on a, uh, a trip to somewhere, these days you really can go on a forecast. Like you can, uh, I would use Wind Guru, which uh, it used to be windguru.cz, but I think now it's .com. And on Wind Guru, you can bring up most places in the world and it will give you a good outlook for the next five days, which will give you a really good general picture of what the weather's going to be like, what the wind's going to be like, what the sea state is going to be like. 
So that way you can get a very quick, uh, reasonably accurate idea of what to expect. And if, like, um, if you want to go somewhere and you definitely want to be sailing every day in 15 knots of wind, check Wind Guru before you go. And if it looks like it's going to be raining every day, no wind, then plan your trip for another time. You can do that. Um, yeah, so that's what I would um, use to get a general impression, uh, a general idea of what a place is going to be like. And then if uh, Wind Guru tells me, oh, yes, this is looking pretty good, or it's looking a bit iffy and you're quite committed into going, or you're already there and you want a more detailed picture, then the second um, forecasting method I would go to is called Windy. I think it's windy.com. Um, and Windy gives an absolutely lovely picture of exactly what the wind is going to, how the wind is going to be acting round um, bodies of land and things. Gives you a very good idea of what's happening. And what you can also do on Windy is you can rewind the last hour of weather and see exactly what's been happening, where it's been coming from. It is really quite fascinating. So here in Vasiliki, when the weather's bad, what we do a lot of the time is we look at the previous hour uh, to see what's been going on in the bigger picture. And then we look at the forecast for the bigger picture. And that way we can get a better idea of what's coming next. So that's quite a handy tool. Um, so there we go. All right. Thanks for tuning in, by the way, everybody. It's difficult to know how many people are still going to be interested um, after such a long time of doing these kind of videos. Um, but, um, it's also... It's also because I'm a bit out of season now, so I'm not actually going sailing these days. Uh, it's good to know that um, that we are still interested. So we have Willis on board. Uh, hello. Uh, late again, not too late this time. I'll back up later. I guess I should say on the dock slash beach in context. Ah, now what's that context? Relating to there, Willis, I'm, have I got a preloaded question of yours? Um, no, I don't believe I do. All right, if you could elaborate on that a little bit, that would be great. In other words, late is left behind. Okay, I've got you. All right, yeah. All right, we have got Shenandoah 2. Hello, I'm French. I have an old F-18, Dart Hawk. Do you know this catamaran? Oh, yes, I do. Um, I never actually sailed one. I always wanted to sail a Dart Hawk. But basically, uh, when the F-18 class first started, there were three boats that, um, that came out initially. There was the Dart Hawk. Uh, there was the Hobie Tiger. And there was the Inter 18 from NACRA. And then the next one that arrived, uh, certainly in Europe, I don't know what was going on in the USA at this time, but in Europe was the DM uh, 18 at that time as well. And um, so those were the original F-18 boats when the F-18 class first emerged. And because the dart was coming from, uh, well, the Dart 18 was the previous kind of main racing boat that Dart was making. And there was a lot of Dart 18 sailors who were looking to move up to something more powerful, uh, a bit more going on. The, the Dart Hawk was getting some good results early on because there was some powerful sailors going into the boat. Um, and then the Hobie Tiger was being looked upon from the outside as the 
not as serious F-18 because the early Hobie Tigers they had, uh, you could either have a yellow and black mainsail or an orange and black mainsail or a blue mainsail. So it was like, oh, it's a Hobie, it's a beach boat, it's not a real racing boat. And then the NACRA was definitely starting as it was going to proceed as a very strong competitor in the F-18 class. But uh, what actually unfolded over the years was the Hobie Tiger was the boat that stayed around for the longest and got better results than any other F-18 in history uh, with more world titles than any other F-18s. So egg on everybody else's face, I should say. Um, and uh, there it is. Um, the Hobie Tiger still a great boat. Whereas you don't see so many Dark Hawks around. I think it could be because there weren't quite so many made. But at the time when it was all new, the Hawks certainly looked the business and everybody wanted to have a go on one. So I hope you're having a great time on that. There in France. All right, we've got St Stefan on board. He's talking about a 20-foot boat. I've got a Miracle 20 this summer. When putting away for winter storage, should I loosen off the diamond wires? Now, um, the correct answer to that is probably yes, you should. Um, but and then, but then, do you, you, if you asked. Do other people loosen their diamond wires for storing uh, such things? People would probably say, no, I don't usually do that. But I would say, yes, uh, take some of the tension out of the diamond wires. If you've got a good place to put the mast uh, indoors, especially, and you don't have to take the diamond wires off for the actual space that you've got available, I wouldn't take them off completely because it is a bit of a job to take them off completely. But like, say your diamond wires are usually set to about, I don't know, 37 on the loose gauge. Then if you loose them off to about 20 or so, then it's going to be a bit more relaxing for the mast. But again, um, try to make sure the mast is uh, supported nicely when it's put away. So if you are store a good way of storing a mast is of course to tie it into the roof somewhere so if there's your roof have your mast like there and just have a few ropes going up to the roof along the mast so that's the back edge of the mast there that's going to be the most comfortable for your mast and the best way to put something that big out of the way good question there stefan all right, HJ, Windy is perfect. Just use the correct model. Okay, might have to look. Oh, and HJ uses Icon EU. All right, we'll have a look into that. All right, Rich, downtime. Time for a trip somewhere nice. Yeah, definitely. Um, Maybe uh, I think we're going to be continuing doing these trips as the weeks uh, continue, which is nice. Rodrigo, hi. Great to have you on board. Tell us more about the um, 27.6 knots on a Hobie 16. How did this absolute mark? How did how they did this absolute mark? Yeah. Um, so I have been in touch with the guys who, so what uh, Rodrigo is asking here is on the speed stick, there is a top speed on the speed stick of 27.6 knots on a Hobie 16. Now, it is a speed that I did have to question because having, I'd say pretty much dedicated my life to sailing fast on all sorts of catamarans, but very much so on the Hobie 16 for the last 20 years. Um, I know how unusual it is to even do 25 knots or 24 knots and how fast that feels. And to be able to go 
to 27 and a half knots. This just uh, blows my mind completely. The guys who went that far said they were going down a wave at the time. Um, but it's still, I'd have to see it to really grasp the concept of going that fast. I think 20, uh, 27 knots on flat water is probably out there somewhere. But in waves, granted, you could pick up a bit of speed going down a wave. But would you actually be going that fast where your boat speed would mean that you wouldn't be on the wave for very long and you'd be going into the next one? Or, uh, yeah, I just can't get my head around that. So it is a very good question, Rodrigo, but I don't have any answers for it. You can only wish that they would have had a camera rolling at the time so we could have seen the action on board. Okay, next question from Dry A X3. Uh, spinnaker upgrade, yes or not worth it? So if you're talking about um, fitting a spinnaker to a boat that didn't previously have a spinnaker on it, we've uh, we've talked about this a few times, and what I've decided would be the reasons to upgrade by putting a spinnaker on the boat is firstly if we talk let's talk not racing so if you sail more of the time in lighter winds so let's say in winds less than 15 knots more often then having a spinnaker on the boat is certainly going to uh make it a lot more interesting a lot more fun uh, on the downwind legs because on all catamarans if it's less than 15 knots more so some than others sailing downwind can be a little bit less interesting whereas if you're sailing in above 15 knots then you can have a pretty wild ride uh, without a spinnaker so this is why I would say if you're sailing more in less than 15 knots, then yes, the spinnaker upgrade is a good option. The second really good reason for having a spinnaker upgrade is if you want to do a lot of long distance sailing, then the spinnaker is really gonna extend your range of how far you can get in a day. Uh, because again, without a spinnaker downwind, you're gonna be a little bit slow, but with the spinnaker, you can probably cover, uh, let's say, something like a third more distance on a downwind leg. So really worthwhile for either lighter wind sailing or distance sailing. If you are racing, then it really depends on who you're racing against. If you're the only boat in the fleet without a spinnaker, then yes. But if you would be the only boat in the, in the fleet with a spinnaker, then I would say probably not because the racing is always the most fun when your boat is very similar to the other boats that you're racing against. Uh, so I think there, there we go. But if you are sailing mostly in stronger winds, like um, in more than 15 knots, then most catamarans give you some pretty good times without a spinnaker so i would say if you're just going out blasting in strong winds then don't worry about uh fitting a spinnaker because you're already having a good time okay so next question with uh we've got david g on board who says just bought new trapeze wires they're coated with plastic the originals were bare any preferences for me? Well, yeah, I would say if you're looking for ultimate performance, not having the plastic coating on the wires is going to just make them that little bit narrower. What you've probably got is like, a, what's a trapeze wire? Two and a half mil? Um, and then the plastic 
is just going to make them a little bit bigger. But uh, the reason that if this, because Hobie Cat Europe put plastic coating on all the trapeze wires and all the shrouds, and what that does is it just makes it a bit more friendly if you happen to uh, bang into something or get it wrapped around you. It's less likely to cause you injury. So we're, every time we replace our rigging on the Hobies and it all comes plastic coated, we never question it. It's just like, yes, that is the way that it should be. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. I think it's a good thing because it does make the boat a little bit friendlier. But then with most of the bigger boats, like F-18s, uh, tornadoes, those sort of things, then you wouldn't usually find plastic coating on the rigging wire because it would be seen to be a bit less performance. There we go. Okay, at this stage in the day, I'm just going to take a short commercial break. Thank you. All right, so yeah, um, totaljoyrider.com is a website that I operate. Um, I've put a lot of the videos on there. I've laid them out differently so it is easier to navigate. The speed stick is on there. I've done some other articles on the website there. But um, the bit that um, we're interested in right now is I also design T-shirts, get T-shirts made, hoodies, uh, hats, other things. Like you may have seen I'm wearing a T-shirt that says Bad Boy 94 while I'm in Joyrider. If you want a custom T-shirt making with your boat's name, sale number, anything at all on it, uh, head over, take a look on totaljoyrider.com and you can basically use anything on there as an idea. Send me an email. I'll design it, send you what it's going to look like. You can tell me if you like it. And then we'll match. we've actually got printers now in the USA, Europe, and in Australia. So wherever you are, give or take, uh, I should be able to get things to you reasonably quickly. There you go. Uh, that was a commercial break. Thank you for staying around. All right, I've got Rob. Who says on holiday in Cabo today from Minnesota? Any experience with proas and shunting? I would say absolutely no experience at all. That's my short answer. Um, where would Cabo be? Is that Cabo, Cabo Verde? Off the west coast of Africa, maybe. All right, Willis says, uh, yes, mast storage on trailer in weather. I do just the opposite. Keep the groove down so it doesn't fill with leaves. If I had a garage, just don't store it on its side as it will warp, perhaps bend a little bit. Yeah, that's what I, yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't matter, mast track down if it's outside. I'd go up if it was inside because then it would naturally be out of the way a little bit more. But the main thing is don't store your mast on its side unless it is actually sitting flat on the floor. Uh, but if you are suspending it, then definitely one way or the other way to it from bending. <laughs> HJ says prior to sailing, 27 knots of boat speed, just take care of your last will. Yeah, just uh, say goodbye to your, your loved ones. All right, well, it says next time you get close to 27, just shut off the camera, throw away your GPS as hard as you can forwards. I reckon that would be pretty hard to do. If you're going that fast, there'd be so much windage taking it backwards. Uh, who can say? All right, Lionel, how you doing? Oh my gosh, I love your channel. Thank you very much. Um, love the fact that you're here right now. That is great. All right, Kerrigan. Hi, uh, which GPS watch do you recommend for sailing with speed and itinerary recording? 
Okay, this is one that we've had before. I'm just going to get. Okay, nice. Um, okay, just having a look. Hello. Okay, so uh, what I've been using for probably for the last three years now is this is a, a Locosys GW60. Um, firstly, I bought this with my own money. They Locosys don't even know that I promote their watch so effectively. And um, but this is really doing. Uh, if I still got some battery on here, oh, yeah, yeah, battery's still good. So, um, this is at, I, the reason I went for this one is because this is the official speed watch of the Windsurfing Speed Sailing Association, and it does seem that the windsurfers have got this whole going fast thing much better organized than us sailors, which is actually why I set up the speed stick in the first place so that we had um, somewhere to record our results and, and um, compare our speeds to each other. But what's nice on here, let's see if we can see this, is you can get on there all of your stats so you've got your max speed, you've got two seconds, then you've got 100 metres, 250, 500 metres. So that means you get a much better, more accurate way of knowing uh, what you were doing and how well you were going. So that is why I'm recommending that one. But there are so many options now, like um, I think Garmin have got so many this was also fairly well priced. I think this was about 200 euros. So not too bad. Um, with all of these watches that I've had, the one thing that I've had that didn't work so well has always been the charger. So I've act I'm actually on my third charger on this one. Same watch, third charger. Um, but that just seems to be a byproduct of everything. All right. So, Lionel says, hold on, I've got to refer back. Does that mean Lionel is in Baja? Rob says Mexico. So Rob's in Mexico. Nice. I'd love to go to Mexico. That must be special. All right. Um, Willis says, bicycle tyre slingshot might get some extra knots all right um yeah keep trying i think just tune the rudders that's going to do it work the main sheet more for more knots all right lionel says i am going to buy a hobie cat am i crazy uh, you're only as crazy as everybody else who's here who's possibly already done something like that or similar so i would say it is a great idea but what I would say is like when you're going to buy anything, just think about how often am I going to be using it? How convenient can I make it to be able to get out as often as possible? If I leave it on a trailer outside my house with the mask down, is it like a 20 minute drive to get to some water, throw the mask up, put the sails up, in you go? Or is it going to be more like a, two hour drive which means it's less likely to actually go sailing that would be my biggest concern when buying something like a catamaran is whether you are actually going to use it very much but yes you should definitely get a catamaran whether it's a hobie cat or anything else um if you're feeling fairly flush uh, then the new NACRA 500 Mark II is looking pretty sweet uh, for a kind of recreational, very quick, lightweight uh, bad boy. Yeah. All right. Hugo, how are you doing? Uh, what do you think is in a match the perfect windward hull angle for sailing downwind with a spinnaker? OK, yes. Yeah, so... Um, 
So if we're talking about getting the hull at exactly the perfect angle for sailing the boat upwind and downwind, downwind, I would say having it a little bit higher if it's less wind and a little bit lower if it's more wind. Um, so if we have our water here and then I would say Okay, maybe that's a little bit high, but I would say on the uh, downwind leg, if it's lighter wind, but enough to be able to lift the hull, having the windward hull lifted, so you've just kind of, I'm gonna have to draw the water again. Uh, we're flying a little bit too high here. So that uh, there's the rudder blade. So we've just got the tip of the rudder blade in the water most of the time. I would say that is the sweet spot. The reason that that would be the sweet spot is because having it flying reasonably high means that if the wind does start to ease, we've got a little bit more time to head up, keep the hull lifted uh, before it starts dropping down and touching the water. When that when, if, when or if that hull does touch the water, it's really like slamming the brakes on. The boat's going to slow down very quickly. So having a bit more of a margin there to keep that hull flying is going to be really helpful. So oh, that is why I'd say in a lighter wind, have the hull flying about there. And then in a heavier wind, perhaps a little bit less because we've got more wind to play with it's a lot easier to get a little bit more power back on quickly if we need to so that would be where i would say the sweet spot is there then crew positions let's assume this is a double-handed boat um so i would have if this was very light winds i'd have the crew right over on the leeward side and the helm if you watched any of those tiger worlds videos we were going very well downwind generally i'd say so i think i can say this with some sort of confidence uh we've got hair today um sitting down towards the mast so that's going to encourage the hull to lift a bit earlier and then as the the wind increases then we can move back um, and then as the wind increases more totally then as the helm we're still going to stay in this kind of position maybe moving back a little bit but the crew can then get out on the trapeze and off we go we are really having a great time there okay so that's what i'm going to say about that. Thanks for the question, Hugo. All right, we've got Max on board. Hi, Max, how you doing? Great to see you. I uh, just want to say a short hello. Cold air, but some nice wind to lift the hull in Bavaria right now. Glad to hear it. Um, keep that hull lifted to the perfect angle, I'd say. All right, Willis says, ooh, that's actually a nice non-joke. Is there a waterproof radio you can recommend with GPS and contact with Coast Guard? Um, okay, this is going to be a short answer. No, I haven't done any research on that. Uh, we use ICOM MC, it's either a 25 or a 23 that we use, which is waterproof, but we put them in a waterproof bag as well, which since we've started doing that does mean they last a lot longer. Um, but you'll have to do some research on that one. 
All right, Lionel says you should get sponsorship. Yes, Lionel, someone should be giving me GPS watches. That's for sure. Um, Shenandoah 2 says, I have watched all tutorial videos from Joyrider TV for beginning with my Dart, a dart Hawk. Thanks for all the explanations, maximum speed, 21.6. Yes, um, send, send me the details. Get on the speed stick. If you've got um, some evidence, like a screenshot or a photograph of your watch or something, when you hit the big speed, then um, yes, send me an email, get on the speed stick. It'll be great having a Dart Hawk on there. We haven't had one yet. All right, bicycle tire slingshot was for the GPS, not gains. I swear it's funny. Okay, if you have a place to park it, get it. Oh, here we go, this is for Lionel. Um, you won't regret it if you use it or cover it up when you're not. There we go. It's another fine argument. Um, HJ, do you have an, any tips for maintenance of a traveller car on a Hobie 16? Uh, mine seems to go a bit rough under load. Yeah, um, <coughs> that is... Yeah, it's a tricky one, that, because what happens with these, uh, if it's the the kind of roller-bearing traveller on the 16, there's two types of Hobie 16 traveller. There's what's called the Trentec one, which is one which is kind of like two plastic pieces, this shape, which come together inside the beam, the track and then the plastic slides up and down if you've got one of those and it isn't sliding very easily then actually this goes for both is have a look at your track so um just move the traveler all the way to one side and just have a look at the track and maybe take some sandpaper or a file and just take any bits of deformity off the track because those bits of deformity are going to be stopping the traveler gotcha um and um causing this kind of grinding feeling especially with the plastic but hj's got the ssi one with the rollers that's this traveler which has got lots of little wheels i don't even know how many it is it must be about 15 and that's all in part of like a there's like a chassis that is the traveler and then a fella like that what um so with these ones what happens over time is the little wheels become a bit flat um on one side which would be the side that ends up at the top so the top of the little wheels will start to flatten and then unfortunately, when that happens, the only thing we can do to keep it running sweet is to actually replace this part because they do wear down. Uh, I'd say after after in the real world, probably after about five to 10 years of use, that's when you're probably going to see the traveler car really starting to grind a bit. And you can just replace the the ball, the bearing part of the traveller car, which would be worth doing. But before doing that, what I would do is really give it a very, very good wash, uh, a really good wash, um, just to get rid of any salt or anything else that might have got in there. Uh, you could try lubricating it a bit with some sort of um, silicon lubricant or a Teflon or something. Uh, just obviously make sure you don't get that anywhere else. See if that improves the situation. But the main cure for it will be replacing uh, the metal part actually fixes onto this, this part that it goes onto is all plastic. And then the wheels go into the plastic. So uh, take a look at that. Oh, hi, Robin. How are you doing? Nice to have you on board. 
All right, we are just coming towards the end of today's q and day. I have got just a few, a few, is it, other preloaded questions. Oh, and this one is actually uh, one who's from HJ, who's talking about the traveler. And HJ is talking about which app to use on the telephone for tracking speed. I've just got my telephone here, actually, so we can have a look at this. Um, so I definitely use Strava. See that, or is there a bit too much reflection? Yeah, um, I'm trying to get rid of the reflection. Okay, so Strava is free. It's really straightforward to use. When you press record, you can then choose which sport you're doing. So um, I've been biking most recently, uh, so much reflection. Uh, so I'll press the little bike fella, and then you can choose which sport you're doing. And I think they're still not sailing specifically on there. Uh, let's see what is there. Stand up paddleboard is on there. Surfing is on there, would you believe? Windsurfing. So I would generally select windsurfing because then what that will do is put your speed into knots, uh, which is going to work much better. So I'd put windsurfing and then just press start when you start the activity and then it will draw a nice lot of thing on the map. And there you go. That is a really good facility and it's free. And because I think Strava is probably one of the biggest, most established apps doing this sort of thing. What I find is that is called Strava. I'll, I'll write it in here, actually. S Strava, like that. Um, yeah, because it's one of the biggest, the most established, it means it works the best, which uh, when you have one, there's so many different apps to do like specific sailing apps for going sailing and things, but they're usually made, uh, they're a lot newer generally and not as established, which means they're going to be a bit more glitchy. They're not going to work quite as well. Whereas Strava works, for me, it works perfectly every time. So I would very much recommend that. Okay, I've got one more preloaded question, then we're going to call it a day. This one is from Gustavo. Who says, oh, this is an interesting one, actually. I've noticed that on the rudder castings, um, there is a layer of neoprene on the inside of the bend. Um, please, uh, I'm just, uh, there's more words there than we need. So, all right, on a rudder casting on a Hobie cat, whether it's a 16 or a, a Tiger 15, 14 or anything, there is a little bit of that rubber, the same as the non-slip that as standard um, is glued in. So if we look at the rudder casting from the bottom, it would be like this, and then this would be this bit where the hole is, where the rudder pin comes up. Can everybody visualize this? And then the bolt for the rudder blade would go through here. And then what we've generally got in these rudder castings, if we're getting them new from Hobie, is there'd be a small piece of rubber in here. Now, this piece of rubber, I would say the purpose of that is so that you don't have your rudder blade directly touching up against that cast aluminium because if you have that directly touching up against the aluminium when it's going up and down or if you do happen to hit something when you're going backwards you're really going to 
you're going to start wearing your rudder blade out. It's going to get damaged uh, a lot more quickly. So that piece of rubber in there is to help protect the uh, rudder blade. Um, but what um, Gustavo also asked is, is this also to help uh, with the angle that the rudder is going to sit down at? So if this is our rudder casting like this, by having something in here, which is stopping the rudder blade coming down as far, that is actually gonna be working against what we're trying to achieve. So that's why on a lot, well, on all of the, the Hobies that we've got, this piece of rubber here is about half of the thickness that um, that type of rubber is on other places on the boat. It's the same rubber that's used on the sidebars for grip. So it's actually a lot thinner and all it's doing is adding protection. It's not actually there to get the rudder to sit further back. So what we're trying to do when we're tuning the rudders is to have them so the front edge is coming as kind of straight down in line as possible. Any further back than that is going to give us heavy steering. Like uh, on the same topic, when you buy EPO3 rudder blades, if anybody's won the lottery and has got that sort of money, I did have a look at the price of them before, and it is a lot. You're better off just buying a new boat and then you get a free pair. Um, but with the new EPO3 rudder blades, they actually come with a piece of this rubber glued on, like there, <clears throat> on the front edge, which kind of lines up with this piece of rubber here. So when I first got the EPO rudder blades that we use here, uh, I had to think hard, um, am I just going to cut it off? And in the end, I did just cut them all off because I tried putting them in with the rubber on and just couldn't get them to sit nicely. So I did cut those pieces of rubber off and uh, never looked back. It was good. We've got one piece of rubber protecting the blades and that is enough. OK, Rich says on NACRA, rubber pads are used to tune rudder lift. Rudders also have a lifting fin. Ooh. Yeah, so um, if it was that the design of the boat meant that you could actually put the rudder too far under the boat, uh, not that this is an issue with any of the Hobies, then you could glue bits of rubber in there uh, to bring the rudder blade further back. But on the Hobies specifically, it's not an issue, but perhaps on the NACRA, uh, the rudder is allowed to go under more than you want it, which is why these rudder pads could be used. But um, I think I'm gonna leave it there. So thanks very much for tuning in everybody. Please hit the like button before you leave. That would be great. Um, I will be back with some more soon. I've got, um, We've got some stuff. I did a short video about things for sale today, and um, which is nice. And then I'm also going to try to get this video done of sailing in all different wind strengths, which will be very interesting. So um, I'll try to get that done. Other than that, thank you very much for tuning in. It's always nice to know that you guys are out there. Thanks, HJ. Um, Willis says there are several videos on making silicon caulking to cushion spots in the rudders. Um, I believe you, <laughs> definitely. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'll see you soon with some more on Joyrider TV. Uh, don't forget to hit the like button. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>